don't have any of the thing that I've taught you until now. They don't have it. Go MIT, Harvard, uh, Columbia, the so-called Ivy League, or Stanford, not Stanford, forget it, just, just forget it. And they were on and off with Berkeley. Berkeley is not so bad in that respect. Uh, but on and off, and in particular, in the Department of Agricultural Economics, because the, the cluster of people in the Department of uh, Agrarian and Agricultural Economics that, that, is, that, that used to be. Riverside was not so bad, and, but there are more three or four, no more, in all of the United States. Outside the United States, in England, there used to be one, okay? There used to be, and that was a the premier university of Britain, uh, but then they, they, have, they have been eliminated. As these people died, they have not been replaced. And that was the University of Cambridge, you know, that initiated the Cambridge School of Economics. That's, that was the top, 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 which comes from Keynes. That was it. But then as people like John Robinson, Pierre Osrafa, Nicolas Caldor, uh, all these people died, they were not being replaced, not only, uh, but the guy who came and became the real uh, uh, boss of the Department of Economics, a guy called Das Gupta, who may actually get the Nobel Prize in Economics on development, uh, is very smart, very intelligent, very smart, and very neoclassical. He's actually taking off the walls, the pictures of John Robinson, the pictures of Morris Dorn, yes, yes, the photographs of Caldo. He's, he's, not, he's not hiding them, he's taking off the wall and putting them in some in kind of dark corners so that no one can really see them. See them. So this is, this is at Sydney University, in the department I come from, at Sydney University, has been the result of a split in the economics department, a split, and we set up, actually they set up because I was against them, so they set up um, a, a department of political economy, separate from economics. And year in and year out, I was wrong in being against them. I thought, I thought it was wrong to create a ghetto of, of uh, of uh, non-orthodox people. But I was wrong, and with my former student and now professor of New South Wales University, Peter Kreisler, we were against, but we were wrong, because you put one orthodox economist into, into a group of non-orthodox, and they are like metastasis. What we could, and they are like the cancer. Yes, because they become the people that they have relations with the business community, they have relations with the institutions, etc., etc., and and slowly they conquer everything. Okay, that is, I have a very good friend at the University of Denver, not not a state university, but the private university of Denver, who was called by the University of Denver in the 80s. He was called to set up a non-neoclassical department, and he was. David Levine is a fantastic guy. And he was um, uh, well, open, open mind. He said, okay, we have, we can have a, we have a non-neoclassical department, but we must have some neoclassical people in it. Okay? So he started to hire a few neoclassic, non-neoclassical people. These people then got, you know, uh, in, 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 in sort of in code with uh, with uh, the dean, okay, business, etc., and in no time he's out of the department. He, he, he moved to the, he was he was he was moved to the school of public administration. He was kicked out. He set up the department. He got kicked out. And in Italy, the, we'll come to that. Later. The worst expression of that is Bocconi University. Bocconi University is a complete cancer to the Italian educational system. It's a total cancer. Okay? But in my talk in, in, in Turin, the main campus next week will be on the cancer part of it, 
represented by Bocconi, an alternative, complete cancerogenous uh, 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 institution. Okay. So, neoclassical economics is, so, but the reason why I'm teaching you the classics and we'll come back to it, to the classics, is because what you have to get uh, in, uh, clear in your head is that there, are, there, there is a, at least, a, at least, the view that plurally there is, the, there is a, a plurality of economic theories. There is no such a thing as the economic theory. It does not exist. Okay? This is something that in political sciences, except those who do uh, electoral you know, studies about elections and behavior in relation to elections, but in political science and sociology, it's completely accepted that there are several theories. In economics, this is not accepted. In economics, you have only one theory. Okay? This is how the economic discourse gets spread around the species, one theoretical basis. And you, within this theoretical framework, you can say all sorts of things. But you must start from just the supply and demand approach. In, but this is not true. This is completely false. It, it is completely false. There are several theoretical approaches. The three big groups are the classical, which end up in Marx, then the neoclassical, which are also the subdivisions which I'll talk about, and then Keynes. And Keynes can be fed as links with neoclassical, but it can also be seen from a classical perspective. The Cambridge, or as Joan Robinson, she was one of the greatest thinkers in economics of the 20th century, um, put it, the, the classic, the, the, the Cambridge school links Keynes to the classical approach, not to the uh, breaks, the link between Keynes and the neoclassical approach. And this is very much due to the input that came from Italy, because Keynes could not have become Keynes without the fundamental, almost a silent contribution by Piero Sraffa, who was in Cambridge since the mid-20s, till he died in 1983. 83 died. Yeah. Uh, and he was he was the one that, with Morris Dobb, was the Marxist economist at Cambridge University, edited the collected uh, works, the complete works of David Ricardo. Okay? And he wrote only one book, essentially, a small book, which would not give him tenure in any other university. But that book became absolutely fundamental, which is called the uh, me, uh, uh, production of commodities by means of commodities. That was a completely revolutionary book, which was written in the late 20s and published only in 1960, after he fell into a ravine. He fell from the mountain in, in Norway, where he was vacationing. And Nicholas Caldor, who was one of the top professors at Cambridge, went to him and said, look, you may die, so let give us per give permission to publish that book mm -hmm. that you have in the drawer and you don't want to show to anyone. And, uh, and that got published simultaneously. In, he wrote it in English and in Italian by himself. You know? And as Keynes used to say, Piero Svafla is the man to whom nothing is hidden. Nothing is hidden. That is, he had a very, very sharp mind, extremely sharp, spoke very little, took a lot of notes because now Trinity College Cambridge has all his uh, uh, works which are unpublished and they are really a huge amount, but he did not publish that much. And, um, and we come that this is a very crucial figure because he is the one who rehabilitated classical economics, 
but that's uh, and in the wake and in connection with Zlafa, they developed especially in Italy. Uh, two people like Luigi Casinetti is one of them. Luigi Casinetti was several times candidate, Nobel Prize candidate, didn't get it because because he's not a neoclassicist, yeah? but he was several times Nobel Prize candidate and developed the classical interpretation of Keynes that connects Keynes with Ricardo, with Ricardo and with also Marx. Okay, so that's it. So neoclassical economics. Why is how do I get back to this? I just see right neoclassical economics has uh, was born uh, essentially, although there were some proto marginalists, the, essentially it was born in 80, between 1850 and 1870. And it has not changed ever since. It is exactly the same. What has changed is the complication, that is to say, the models have become more and more complicated, right? But the fundamental theory, it has not changed ever since. So, what is, it's called the correct approach, the correct terminology is not neoclassical. Neoclassical is, uh, came, uh, is more recent, is after the Second World War. Uh, the correct term definition is marginalist economics. Marginalist. Why it's called marginalist? Because, because, it uses the method of marginal variations, okay, of infinitesimally small variations. So it achieves, it attains its analytical results simply by the means of using differential calculus. And that's why it's called marginalism. So in a sense, uh, the, the infinitesimally small change determines okay, the theoretical outcome. I'll, I'll now come to this is the technical aspect of it. The philosophical aspect, which is very important, that is the most important for you who are not going to be economists, is the most important, is that unlike classical economics, which is supposed to, was supposed to, was in a declared manner. It was not axiomatically based. Cla classical economics is not based on axioms. It's based on an attempt to conceptualize historical processes. Okay? So in Adam, in, in, the, in the physiocrats, they say, okay, the structure of society in France is based on three classes. Hmm? And two sectors of production, agriculture and artisans, aristocracy, peasants and artisans. And how those classes and those sectors interact. What are the natural laws like the circulation of the blood? How the, that's the physiocrats, right? That's the, the enlightened economic activity to the circulation of the blood in the body. The classics in other cities are going, here we have this big phenomenon of, of industrial revolution in Britain. I'm going to explain, and my idea is that in the light of the industrial revolution, uh, the wealth of a nation is not determined by gold. It's not true that gold is wealth. It is production which determines the wealth of a nation. And there it takes it, tries to explain what the, the term is. Uh, dynamics of production. He may be wrong, he may be mistaken, he may be this, but that, that approach derives from a historical interest and objective. Similar in Ricardo. Ricardo is the same thing. I mean, he, 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 is what, he, what are the factors that may prevent capital accumulation? Because Ricardo was very much in favor of capitalistic accumulation. Factors that prevent capital accumulation is rent encroaching on, on profits. Okay? So that's, that's the analysis. E mass is in, in the same vein is the dynamics of a concrete historical formation 
of capitalism, okay? Or what he calls the capitalist mode of production. And the introduction of a new element into it by Marx, leaving aside the labor theory, value, surplus, and all that sort of stuff. The introduction that economic systems are not natural. There is no such thing as a natural economic system. They are all the result of societal social relations. Okay, that's the very important. That work, exactly like the feudal economic system was historically determined and therefore historically confined, the same thing, the capitalist mode of production has its own historical dynamics and it's not necessarily eternal, it's not a natural system. That's, that's what we yeah, are. Okay? Then there are other things that would be worth looking at in Marx, but I don't have time to uh, elaborate upon. In neoclassical economics, the philosophical approach is totally different. It comes from you and especially Jeremy Bentham utilitarianism. Jeremy Bentham, the British philosopher who developed the notion of utilitarianism. That's where it comes from. And it's a radical view, it's radical, it's not an apology of the economics. It became an apology of the economic system of capitalist relations later, as I said, mostly through the Italian, uh, it's one of the founders of modern sociology, Pareto. It's through Pareto that has become to an apology of the capitalist system, to the welfare theorems of Pareto. But it was not born as such. It was born as a radical view about the role of man, as they used to say, sorry for using this expression, right? <laughs> the role of man, homo economicus, in, in, not in abstraction, but in isolation and from any societal concept. So it is what determines the economic behavior of human beings taken individually, okay, taken individually of human beings in the context of utilitarian philosophy. So Jeremy Bentham is what people aim at maximizing joy and minimizing pain. Now that's the famous slogan, the famous statement by Jeremy Bentham. Okay? That's the utilitarian. And you can find this utilitarian approach in, 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 in David Hume and Hobbes and all that sort of So it comes from there. And the, the, in Britain, the, the essentially, essentially the founders were Stanley Germans, all 90s, eighty seven. And I forgot his first name, but it's as important as German, Wixley. Well, Wixley, by the way, was also a priest. Wixley. Uh, and that is in, in, in the 1870s. The, the, uh, what they have developed is the view of prices the transition, sorry, the transition from classical economics in Carter, Marx was not considered in Britain, okay? Marx had no, no, had no currency in Britain. First of all, he wrote in Germany just about everything. So, <coughs> number one. Secondly, because of the thing, you know, revolution, all that sort of stuff, he was uh, So, the transition from Ricardo, David Ricardo, to to the to the to the neoclassics, to Stanley Jevons and Wixie, uh, is represented by a great political economist, very important in the in the sphere of political philosophy as well, and that's by uh, John Stuart Mill. Okay? Now in Ricardo, like in Charlie, okay, Charlie like in Charlie, Charlie is Marx. <laughs> In Ricardo, like in Charlie, okay, what you have is prices are determined exclusively by the social cost 
of production needed to produce commodities. And this social cost is expressed by the labor theory of value, right or wrong in terms of the proportions between direct and indirect labor. Let's leave this aside. That's, that's the thing. There's nothing. So demand, <coughs> not aggregate demand, individual demand, does not enter it. Does not enter. You follow? Does not what? Demand does not enter into the determination of these prices. Yeah, okay. It does not enter. Mm -hmm. hmm? uh, which means that you cannot build into this system a theory of why do you drink coffee instead of tea or tea instead of coffee. There is no system of preference. You follow me? There is, therefore, there is no system of choice of commodities. Uh, they assume, because of the fundamental assumptions of classical economics, classical economics assumes that wages are at subsistence. Okay? Wages are at subsistence. So you, you eat, you know, corn and you drink the beer. I mean, there is a bunch of commodities that are necessary staple food for the workers. The capitalist, the role of the capitalist in classical economics is not to consume, is not to have to have Rolls Royces. They may have Rolls Royces because they are rich and they can buy Rolls Royces, but that's not their social role. To have Rolls Royce as a social role, to have well, that's the aristocracy in the physiocrats that they have Louis XV and the Chin and the mirrors and the Couponet uh, and all that sort of stuff. But that's in the aristocracy. In the capitalist system, the role of the capitalist is the agent of capital. You understand? So the classics from Adam Smith, every frugal man, a public benefactor. To Charlie himself. They are essentially Weberian. Max Weber. Yeah? Essentially Weberian. Max Weber wrote you know, the, uh, um, uh, the Protestant Ethics and the Spirit of Capitalism. Okay? I read it in Italian, so that's why the, the English title is mean, not so correct. Let him understand the spirit of capitalism. And this, um, but Max Weber argues the reason why capitalism developed in Protestant countries, it is because every frugal man is a public benefactor, right? Uh, 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 Max Weber provides the sociology for Adam Smith. Hmm? Essentially, that's what it is. The cultural sociology of Adam Smith. And so it's in mass. Therefore, the capitalist in mass, the role of the capitalist is not to consume, although the capitalist having more money may have you know, either better shoes or uh, carriages or today would be a Rolls Royce and stuff like that. But this is not the relevant aspect. The relevant aspect is that the capitalist must manage the accumulation of capital. Therefore, the assumption, the implicit assumption, but it's quite strong, this implicit assumption, surfaces very strong. The implicit assumption is that capitalist consumption, luxury consumption, is, is not taken into account in the classical model. So what you have? When you have the classical model is polarized. It has pure wage earners whose role is to be exactly like horses and oxen in farming. That is to say, you have to feed the horse, you have to feed the donkey, right? Because otherwise you won't get the plow pulled, and you have to feel you know, to, to feed the animals that operate as machinery. The same thing with the workers, you feed them, you know, so you pay them a wage, which is a subsistence wage for them to carry on production. And the role of the capitalist is not to consume, the role of the capitalist is to accumulate capital, as well as to manage capital. And that's what the role is. So, at this point, you have very little choice in terms of consumption choices. What, what, what choice do you have? Yeah. It's not much. I think that this is a correct interpretation of a particular stage of capitalism. I think that is correct. But what, I'm to, what I want to say, this explains why they have no 
consumption choices in their system. There is no such, there is no place, there is no role to individual demand curves, to individual demand. There is no role. The others, this one, Jevons, uh, but there also there is a, 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 also a Frenchman in 1823, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Cordon, uh, Augustin Cordon, who is very important for the theory of monopoly. Uh, is they had a completely different approach. They started from the view, utilitarian view, of what motivates economic behavior of single individuals. And the economic behavior of single individuals is based on the view that people have a set of, write it down, okay? Because, write it down a set of preferences, you have a set of preferences, I express now myself in very modern terms, I'm not using that terminology, I'm using general equilibrium set, mathematical set theory time of terminology, which is clear in my view, once you study it, you absorb it, it becomes clearer and you can uh, express it directly in that way. So you have a set of preferences, so you have a bundle of commodities, which can be uh, any bundle that you like, any combination uh, of that can be egg, can be burberry scarf, can be you know, all sorts of commodities on which you have a preference over other commodities. You follow me? For, for instance, I have a preference over cashmere scarf because the because the uh, wool is such a stickling that I don't like it. You know, so I, even if it cost more, significantly more, when I, by the, when I want to buy a scarf, I buy a cashmere scarf. <laughs> and then I lose it and it's a disaster. <laughs> so, but this is, this, is, uh, this is a preference set. So we have, every one of us has a preference set. They use the, they use the Latin motto, the gustibus non disputandum est. You do not dispute, you do not discuss taste. Taste are given. Yeah? So I don't interfere with your taste. I can, I'm, not, I'm not judging your taste. Okay? This is important. It's a very, very important principle. Because if you don't set up a normative view of what you are consuming. I'm not. So, uh, given the taste, given the preferences, Individuals will maximize what? The equivalent of pain and joy. Joy and pain. Benza, you maximize joy, you minimize pain. The equivalent in economics becomes, in this utilitarian view, it beca becomes the maximization of utility. Yeah? You maximize utility. Hmm? You maximize utility, but you must have a constraint. What is the constraint of this utility? You cannot maximize ad infinitum this utility. Otherwise, you, you will consume endlessly. Okay? So, you maximize the utility under the principle of diminishing marginal utility. That is to say that the more you consume, total utility increases. Do you understand? Total utility. So you, you start with one scarf. Let's say that I have one scarf. Because I lose them. Forget about the fact that I lose them, because otherwise that's infinite utility. I end up infinite. <laughs> My demand becomes infinite because I, I lose them. I misplace them and I lose them. Therefore, I always need scarves. Right? But let us assume that I, assume I don't lose them. So the first scarf gives me, gives me a big chunk initial utility. Okay? And then second scarf, I still get more utility. Third scarf, that's where it's important. I get more utility, but at a diminishing rate. That is to say, the increasing utility that I get from the second relatively to the first okay, is greater 
then the increase in utility from the third relatively to the second. So, so the utility, absolute utility keeps growing, but marginal utility is diminishing, diminishing, diminishing. When do you stop? When do you stop? Okay, this, you stop, you have to introduce <coughs> a constraint in order to understand where you stop. You don't start with an infinite amount of, let's say, money. It's, it's a moneyless economy, and in textbook they use money as a reference, which is wrong. You don't start with an infinite amount of endowments, of uh, it's endowment, not money. They, in textbook, they wrongly present it as a money, and they call this money a budget constraint. So you have a budget constraint, you know, because it, it is appealing in terms of an example that people have, I don't know, a weekly budget or a yearly or a monthly budget or whatever, uh, 500, 1,000 euros and so forth. And, and you said, within this budget constraint, you can spend your money by choosing between among different goods, okay? Given your bundle of preference, given your set of preferences. In reality, this is not money. You don't have money <coughs> because the theory is moneyless. It does not have money in it, and it cannot have money in it. This is an important point that you have to understand. It, it, is, it cannot accommodate money except in a very, very peculiar way, which is called money neutrality. We'll come to that later. But the, the uh, what you don't, you don't have infinite endowment. So you are constrained by the endowment that you trade with other people. You understand? So the notion of this is a theoretical market, therefore. You bring your endowments to the market, okay? And you start trading those endowments. This endowment can be, say, eggs, uh, it roots. You bring them to the market. Or it can be also other types of endowments. They're called skills or whatever. You, know, you bring your endowment. You don't ask where they come from. No asking where they come from. You bring this endowment to the market. You start trading them. The endowment represents the budget constraint. And you trade them. And by trading, you select what you want to buy. So you sell only because you want to buy. Everybody is a seller of something, and everybody is a buyer of something. Okay? Everybody is an agent, is a trader. Everyone is a trader. Consumers are traders. Everyone is a trader. So the budget constraint represents the limit to which you can undertake the purchase. Okay? <coughs> so how you undertake this purchase? Another element in the individual approach is, in this individualistic approach, it's called also methodological individualism. The other element is the principle of non-satiation. Non you understand? You, more is always better than less. So you, you don't use satiation, saturation of, uh, uh, as a limit. So, so how do you reach, therefore, this limit, you have the budget constraint, which is, but then you have also the prices of the things that you buy. Okay? This is determined by the relative abundance of, and scarcity of the commodities in existence, of the goods in existence. They don't use the term commodities, they use <coughs> the term goods. Therefore, a, a typical individual agent in the case of the neoclassical approach will have a budget constraint, a system of preference. This gives rise to what's called the indifference curve. I'm not going to, to explain it now, the, what the indifference curve is. But it gives a system of preference and will select which good to buy from its own bundle, bundle of preferred commodities, will select which good to buy, which proportion to buy, on the basis of the relative abundance and scarcity of those goods. 
So, the usual <coughs> example, which is pretty okay, given in textbook, is say apple and pears. Okay? So, if given the budget point statement, there is, this is where the change comes in. If you have a, an increase in the number of apples available in the economy, in the system, and apples and pears are part of your bundle of preferences, right? so what you do is you will buy more, bu more apples because your, uh, the price of apples will fall and so will your marginal utility. The marginal utility also okay, diminishes. You understand? So there is a strict connection between the movement of price, which is a market equilibrium price. It's not the price that you see today, which are not money prices, it's all real prices. Okay? So, the, there is a strict connection between the movement of prices and the dynamic of the marginal utility. So the more, say you have another year, another batch of apples come into the market, okay, you still buy more apples because you have the principle of non-satiation, okay, and you will get a lower and lower and lower marginal utility when and the lower price. When the last Apple is sold, okay, when the last apple is sold, when, when, when you stop buying apples, this means that your marginal utilities are perfectly satisfied. Okay, you are in equilibrium. You, you achieve the equilibrium of the single consumer. That's why it is. In, so what what the, what what determines the dynamic of the of, of the whole system is the utility function which is connected to demand. You follow me? It's connected to demand. It's the utility function relatively to a bundle of commodities, good A, good B, which is connected to, which gives rise in effect to the mechanism of demand, whereby you are demanding the stuff in, in, in the market. That's the equilibrium of the single of the single consumer. This has to be consistent with the equilibrium of all the consumers. That is to say, it has to be consistent with a general multi-market equilibrium. You understand? And how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, you must make the assumption, which is a very iffy assumption, it's an iffy assumption, there's a huge mathematical literature on that, huge, okay, that you can make a, a, a you can build a utility index, an index number, like you have index number for things, like you have index number in just about every statistical thing, you build a utility index and therefore you measure <coughs> the utilities of all the other consumers. Hmm? If I build an index number, like you have a price index, for instance, you can have you can measure different things. How can you measure a table relatively to a chair? In the labor theory of value, this is solved by the quantity of labor time necessary to produce the table relatively to the amount of labor time necessary to produce the chair. So that's solved. That's how you measure that. Hmm? But in your classical economics, where you don't have that sort of stuff, then you depend on demand, on the utility function of consumers, you must have a utility index whereby you bring together all the consumers. Once you have a utility index whereby you can compare and add up all the utilities, once you have added up all the utilities together, you have the general equilibrium of, consumer, of the consumers. Okay? So if you can come up with a utility index, you are in business to generate a to identify the existence, or whether it exists or not, of a general equilibrium for all consumers 
in a pure barter trade economy. That's a very important element. There is no production here. Unlike classical economics that starts right away with production, there is absolutely no production here. Here, you don't ask <coughs> how things are produced. Do you follow me? You don't, you don't, you, people go to the market with a bundle of goods, they trade these things, they have a system of preference, they have therefore utility functions attached to it, and uh, by the end of the day, if prices are perfectly flexible, that is to say, if they follow the dynamics of marginal utility, okay, if no one interferes with those prices, so you have another apple thrown into the market, then the price will, will fall, etc. And therefore, the marginal utilities of the increase, the marginal utilities in uh, uh, for the consumption of this additional apple will uh, clearly uh, uh, increase at a lesser degree further, and so forth. Then you should come to a general equilibrium where supply, where the available stuff is perfectly traded in the market. And you get a general equilibrium of the individual consumers consistent with the general equilibrium, with the equilibrium with, of all consumers. Okay? That, that's, that's, that's what it is. So this is where the, the story ends. End of the story. That's it. That's finished. What is the... This is neoclassical equilibrium. So, the result, the, the upshot is this, that the price, the, the, the result of all this is that <coughs> the price of a good, price of any good X, okay, is equal to the marginal utility obtained by using <coughs> by consuming good X over the, the quantity of the use of good X. Okay? That's what it is. This is the, the price of good X. The equilibrium price is simply the equilibrium price of all commodities. If you have <coughs> two goods, must be equal to the proportion of the marginal yield. The proportion between marginal utilities determines the proportion between prices. You follow? So once you know if perfect competition, this is, this is what perfect competition is about in your classical economics. Perfect competition is that you do not, there is no element that can interfere with the, 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 the expression, the dynamics of which is a static process, this dynamic, okay? Because you start with a given amount of commodities, a bundle, you don't have, uh, you don't have production processes in it, and you simply measure how the utility of the consumers under the specified constraint changes, varies, as the quantity of any of the two commodities or any of the component of the bundle of commodities as the quantity available in the market changes. You can see that you can get the price only if you get a change. This is theta. Theta defines the marginal change, okay? The change at the margin, at the limit. You can see that you can get the price only if you have a change. If you have no change, you don't get the price. If you, have, you cannot have the relative price ratio between how much a commodity exchanges its value is worth relatively to the other, if you don't have the marginal process. If you don't have the marginal process, you cannot have the price. Do you understand that? 
because if, if theta is zero, <coughs> if the variation is zero, you don't have the price at all. Analytically, it's very different from classical economics. In classical economics, you do not have any marginal change at all. You know? uh, processes are, are either under constant returns to scale, which is to say that they are constant, there is no change at all, uh, or they are under increasing returns to scale, which is actually the opposite of this thing. And, and therefore, um, in, in, in classical economics, you can get the price independently of any change. You don't need change. Here, you must have change at the margin in order to obtain the price. So the price is obtained through the changes of the marginal uh, utilities of one commodity relatively to another. This principle is applied to everything else. When they bring in production later on, in 18, around 1890, through a very, very significant uh, uh, economist called, Swedish economist called Excel, Excel, but the same principle is then applied to production. Okay? We'll see that because that's what we want to understand. Okay? Yeah, but the, the, the price in in your classical economics at the, at, the, at the purest level, that is to say the level of barter trade, where you do not analyze production at all, you have just a bundle, a bunch of commodities which are thrown into the market. The price is determined by the changes in the utility. So it's not determined by absolute utility. Okay? It's determined by the variation of the utility. If you don't have the variation of utility, you don't get the price. Okay, therefore, if you say, what is the price? I have 100 kilograms of apples and 100, or 1 kilogram of apples and 1 kilogram I want to buy. Uh, I, I have in the market available 1 kilogram of apples and 1 kilogram of, uh, kilogram of pears. What is the price? I cannot tell you. Because what you have to tell me here, what I have to, what I have to know is the change. The history of the price. Not the history of the price. No, 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 no. No. What I, what you have, okay, these are the two, kilo, the, we have two kilograms of apples. What will happen, okay, if you have one kilogram of apples and one kilogram of pear? What, have I, what happens if we have 1.5? kilograms of apples relatively to 1.5, 1 to 1 kilograms of pears. You understand? So you start with 1 kilogram of apples, 1 kilogram of pears. You have absolutely no idea of what the price is. Then you define the utility function of the, of the consumer. And then the next thing that you do, you introduce a change. They introduce a change, you bring in either more apples or more pears. You keep the other one constant, you make the, this is why I said it's a partial derivative, okay? You keep the other one constant, you throw, notionally, notionally, you throw into the market another 500 grams of, of apples, okay? And then you say, how will the utility of the consumer behave relatively to that? Well, on the basis of the principle of diminishing marginal utility, you should expect the consumer to demand more if the price is for, but will get less and less utility at the margin. So absolute utility increases, but marginal utility diminishes. That's how, it, that's, that's how the price comes up. This means that the first uh, derivative, so to speak, in mathematical terms, the first variation is always positive, okay? First variation is the absolute increase is always positive utility. You always get an increase in utility. Then the second derivative, that is to say, the variation, uh, the, the rate at which it changes, then it's negative, okay? Neg it's negative. So that's that's the, that's the condition by which the 
price converges to an equilibrium. That's how the price converges to equilibrium. So the dynamic of the price must always follow the must be consistent with the dynamic of the marginal utility. You follow me? Yeah. Will we expect will we be expected to uh, know the formulas and kind of be able to do these mathematical questions? But this is why I'm spending so many words, right? Yeah. So that 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 uh, to 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 give you the pictorial view of the formulation, which you also find in the text by Varoufakis, uh, which is in the readings. Uh, but uh, I'm trying to convey the concept to you, so that since, since you're not, that's a good thing that you're not economist. <laughs> You'll be already corrupted by that. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Um, more consumption uh, increases Sorry. utility. More consumption increases utility, total utility. When does uh, marginal utility start to diminish? No, marginal utility starts to diminish uh, start to diminish the moment you increase the, the, you, the moment you make this uh, uh, purely conceptual experiment whereby you throw more, just one more unit. Just at the moment you throw one more unit of a particular commodity into the market, okay, and you keep all the others uh, given, then at that point margin utility will will this mechanism kicks in. Okay? So it starts right away. Yeah. I didn't understand one thing. You said that it's impossible to determine the price of goods if we don't introduce a change. That's right. And so at the beginning we have to determine, if, it, if I have well understood, the, the, the utility, the utility um, function of each consumer and then introduce the change. And how do we determine this first step? I mean, is that completely arbitrary? Is, do we have to kind of image an interview to the consumer? Or what? how do we determine his preferences? without the change at first? No, the preferences are given by the bundle of commodities. By the bundle. So by the quantity, like one peer is... No, no, by the bundle, bundle, not the quantity, uh. the bundle. For instance, let me give you something that will never enter into, uh, into my bundle of commodities, peanut butter. Okay. I hate it. When I, when I first landed in the United States, it was, it was it's disgusting. So, I will never eat peanut butter, okay? So peanut butter doesn't enter into my, so I can have as many quantities as you like of peanut butter, I don't, it doesn't enter into my bundle of preferences. You understand? Yeah. No, I, I, I do okay. understand. So it's not a matter of quantity. It's I don't have any preference over peanut butter. For, so for me, from a neoclassical point of view, the price of peanut butter is here. Because if there is no preference over the commodity, the price is zero. If a commodity is not demanded, the price should be zero. But let's say that you love apples and pears, and yeah. how do you determine your function of preference of apples and pears before introducing the change and no, therefore you, you have exactly the, the same. You have exactly the same utility function. I have a utility function. One and one. Yeah, yeah. I have a utility function whereby I have in the argument, I have the, I have the bundle of preference and they have utility functions whereby I, uh, I put in the argument apples and pears and all that sort of stuff and I know that this utility, I assume, I make the axiomatic assumption, axiomatic assumption, it's axiomatic theory, I make the axiomatic assumption that this utility function has the following features. First derivative positive, second derivative negative. That's what I need. I don't need anything else. And I apply this to every good. Every good that shows up in my Perfect. basket of yes. That's it. Finish. So they all have the same values at first? No. Kind of. No, it's not the same value. I, I don't have the English term for that. Valenza. No? Okay. They have the same, they have the same um, significance. Not the same value. Because okay. the value will be different given the quantities. 
deep, the quantity is different, so the value will be different. Okay. Okay. Is it utility variable depending on the person, and what does that be given for a given problem? Because these are kind of like, like it can be boiled down to like a mathematical problem. Yeah. And if you're given a problem, you can say for you know the professor, the utility of pairs are such number to be that one is this. That's right. You, therefore, you specify a right. bundle. You specify. You specify that what you have, but that's perfect. You specify the bundle of preferences in so relation to the individual. So you have to have a utility. The utility function is the same. We right. always operate according to diminishing, uh, to the principle of diminishing larger utility. What you change is the way in which you, you specify the, 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 the things that are, yeah, the, the, the yeah. thing that, yeah. Okay. In fact, Jabez, uh, Stanley Jabez was another great, another guy. <laughs> It's either Edgeworth, Edgeworth, one of the founders of general equilibrium. He was actually a professor of literature in Oxford, and he was a professor of philosophy. And then developed actually what was very, very close to general equilibrium theory in Oxford in 1880s, something like that. Yeah, 1880s. Edgeworth uh, explained exactly by using that sort of argument that he put forward. He explained the fact why, because he was saying, okay, but, but this, this situation doesn't, how do you explain differences in incomes, difference, the fact that, that I don't know, that for instance, a person from humble economic origins uh, uh, does not have access, I don't know, to a sophisticated uh, advanced uh, painting, you know. I don't know, the Leonardo da Vinci that cannot have access to it, that doesn't have the means. And then he explained that he was a very aristocratic person. He explained that with the fact that that thing doesn't enter into the preference system. Leonardo da Vinci, enjoying a Leonardo da Vinci painting, or a Raffaello painting, and therefore traveling to the place where the Raffaello painting is located would not does not enter into the system of preference of the person of humble economic origins. Okay? And therefore you cannot compare. You cannot you cannot say that there isn't any quality there. You see what that's what he argued. Uh, so once you specify the things that enter into the bundle of preferences into the system of preferences but the utility function must have exactly the same features. That is to say, it's subject to the principle of diminishing marginal utilities. Okay? That's, that's, that's the neoclassical system. I want to get, this is the analytics of the neoclassical system. This doesn't give us supply. It gives us only the, the law of demand. This gives us the law of demand. That is to say, the de demand, okay, price, and quantity are related how? How are they related? If I were to write a if I were to write a uh, I write here price and I write here quantity, okay? How should they be related? Unambiguously in 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 neoclassical economics, they should be related inversely. That's the law of demand. That's it. That's the law of demand. There is no supply here. The supply is given. There is a, 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 a quantity of goods which are brought to the market, and they are traded. So that is that is it, this is the. Without this, there is no neoclassical economics. There is no such a thing. There is no market economics without that as market equilibrium theory. So that's the law of demand. By the way, this law of demand that has been totally destroyed. Totally destroyed. Okay. By neoclassics themselves, actually. By the neoclassics themselves. Hmm? There is a this is just a preview, just preview. Don't don't uh, just like a like a, a not even a preview, it's like uh, a, a, an advertising flash. 
<laughs> and uh, um, th there is a theorem which is called the uh, Sonnenschein Mantel de Breu theorem, which was developed in 1970, between 1970 and 1973, 1974. This is a Sonnenschein Mantel, uh, Mantel de Breu theorem, where we show that this doesn't work. We don't have that. Okay? And this, which means that it destroys totally the fundamental. That's the fundamental. It's like uh, the fundamental basis of neoclassical economics is, is, is destroyed by the neoclassics themselves. Okay? But because this has been pushed into the put into the very you know into the Olympus of of uh, of uh, mathematical economics, no one no one uh, actually pays attention to, to this. Except one guy who is in Marseille, Universite, Universite de Ex Marseille, and he's actually a, a, a Briton who migrated, got the job, it was at York University, very good mathematical economist, uh, very good mathematical economist, that the Alan Kerman, his name is, and, and he goes to the fish market of Marseille. Okay? He goes to the fish market and he developed a model of that fish market, a very interesting theoretical model of the fish market, uh, in which he actually argues that, uh, well, there is no way you can have this sort of stuff in, in a natural market. Okay? That's, that's, uh, and he developed, he developed, he wrote in 1989 a very, very good paper in the economic journal, which is called The Emperor Has No Clothes. That is to say, this is all fun, okay? But this is something that, this is the brief, the flash, yeah? just to attract you later. Okay, so this is the, this is the, essentially the approach of Stanley Jevons, Wixty, Wix and Valras, Leon Valras, who in 1974 developed the first system of general in France. Not in France, it's actually, yes, I think it was in France, then he was kicked out of France, he was, because couldn't find jobs and ended up in Lausanne. And he founded the Lausanne School of Economics. The first chair was Leon Vargas. Second chair was Wilfredo Pareto uh, from, from, from Italy. He okay? uh, developed the welfare properties of this system. What are the welfare properties of this system? The welfare property of the system is that Once a general equilibrium is attained, okay, and you attain a general equilibrium, we are not yet in the world of the Zonenschein Mantel de Berth theorem, so uh, we attain the general equilibrium with all con of all consumers. What are the welfare properties? That's what Pareto found. He found the welfare properties. The welfare properties means that perfect competition rules and it's optimal, that is to say it is Pareto efficient, perfect competition, if no one can be made better off, okay, without somebody being made worse. So you Pareto efficiency is that position where you cannot improve. If you improve somebody's position, you make somebody else worse. Hmm? That's, so that's the point in which you reach Pareto efficiency. You cannot further improve the position in terms of it always defined in those terms. Okay? Um, but this is what neoclassical economics is. And, and now I want to just... Uh, um, that's the, the basic thing of neoclassical economics. I want to, this, to, to uh, point out to some philosophical aspect. First of all, agents are just individual, okay? It's an atomistic system. There is no, as Margaret Thatcher put it, Margaret Thatcher, she said, there is no such a thing as a society, right? Well, that's what it is. Margaret Thatcher is famous for that statement. There is no, she made that statement in, there is no such a thing as a society, there are only individuals. That's it. 
That's, this is the system. What is perfect competition? Is no one interferes with the process of the attainment of uh, marginal utility at the equilibrium. There is no interference. So no one, there is no one that can manipulate the price in that respect. And no one can manipulate the price, but in the sense that prices perfectly follows the the, the dynamics of the marginal uh, maximizing marginal utilities. That's uh, maximizing utility functions. So no one interferes. There is no there is no possibility of interfering with that. Okay. This has led, and I'll, I'll finish uh, on this note because I want to move to that. This has led to quite very complicated. So, but how, how, how can you ensure? Because the robustness of the theory is that it has to be, this is all the philosophy, because it's an axiomatic theory. So, it's like it's Aristotelic, essentially. It's an Aristotelic theory, essentially, right? Because it's a completely, you start from assumptions and you come down. You don't have to look at around you. You can stay, you can stay, you know, the Everest mountain if you have oxygen enough, etc. You can work out the theory. You don't need any reference in practice. There is no need. In fact, it cannot connect with anything which is practical, okay, in that respect. Or historical. It's a, a, a view about human behavior in the human in terms of individual of methodological individualism Human behavior applied to economic, to, to the questions of how you buy, uh, you obtain goods, and you prefer a good coffee over tea and stuff like that. Uh, the, the, so you have to make sure that your theory holds, theoretically, even the that you have to make sure that your theory holds when you say that no one should interfere. There should be no interference. You might, how, how do you make sure? How do you make sure, for instance, that coalitions can, if you have many, many traders, many agents in the market, many people, etc., how do you make sure <coughs> they, they, don't, they don't coalesce and therefore determine impact upon the price? The coalition means you form a kind of monopoly, a kind of price control mechanism, right? So, how do you make sure that? The theory must make sure that this doesn't happen. It's the theory, it's not a matter of practice. It's a conceptual structure whereby you, you have to have in your head a mechanism whereby you say, okay, yeah, but coalitions are not really, they cannot happen. How do you ensure? Well, somebody can say, okay, yes, you're fine. This is, all, this is all great. But, you know, people can get together, you know, they can talk, chit chat, etc., and they set the price. You know, this happens, you go to Istanbul. You know, in the market, you have to trade and stuff like that. Too. So, how do, you, how do you make sure that this doesn't happen in the, uh, in the bazaar? Yeah. It's not a bazaar. No, it's not even a bazaar economy, because there's no life in this economy. It's got no life, there's nothing. Uh, and so, uh, how do you make sure that? Well, that is an issue. That's a very big issue. An issue that developed, out of which developed a huge literature in mathematics. Yeah? And I tell you, it's actually very easy to understand, not the mathematics, because it involves also uh, game theories and all that sort of stuff. Yeah? But it's abstruse because you have to find it, <coughs> find the solution to find the results within this framework. But the, the concepts leading to those proofs are very clear. And in fact, the concepts were set out by Edgeworth. Uh, Isidro Edgeworth it was great thing, very aristocratic, etc. So it's so all in the 1880s. The mathematics and the proofs came out only in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. So I'm, I'm giving you the interpretation of Edgeworth by using the mathematical proofs of the 1870s and 1970s and so on. Edgeworth wrote a book which is called, uh, I don't remember. No, I really don't even say, I have a blank now. It's a famous book, uh, Mathematical Cycle, something like that. Uh, 
And we, in that book, which I remember having seen the, read the table, he actually raises the issue. Edgeworth raises the issue. And he says, okay, but if we have two traders, it's perfect competition, right? Because they, they are two traders, they have to exchange, so they, they cannot collude, right? By definition, right? Then he started to increase the number of traders. He has, a, he has a numerical example whereby he increases the number of traders. And this number of traders, well, he finds that as you increase the number of traders at beyond a certain point, three, already three, two can form a coalition against one. Okay? So they can impose, two can impose the price on the other, three on the Two, so, so on the third. So he started to expand, to expand, and he realized then. He realized because he was also a logician. He realized that if you increase, 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 increase the number of traders, in fact the chances of coalitions diminish. Yeah, because you have very, 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 very difficult to get a coalition and so on. So the chances of coalitions diminish. Yeah, but that doesn't yet establish the condition. So this, then he basically said, OK, if you have many, many traders, then coalitions may not necessarily, may not necessarily happen. But they may also happen. Hmm? May not necessarily, but may also happen. If they happen, this thing goes out of the window. But to make a long story short, in the, eight, in the 1960s to the 1980s, there have been a number of proofs which are published mostly in the Journal of Mathematical Economics and in Econometrica, which is another very important journal where people would sell daughters and stuff in order to get published there. Um, uh, the, uh, the, there have been a number of proofs uh, concerning the possibility of coalitions. Well, essentially, this number of mathematical proofs, there are several of them, is that, yes, you can have a situation in which coalition are not likely, are not likely, it's not that they will never be formed, are not likely to be formed only if the number of traders is infinite. It's so large as to, to be mathematically precise, is so large as to approach infinity. Only then you can say, okay, the likelihood of coalition is very scant indeed, is very limited indeed. But that was not enough. Because still you can have the possibility of coalition. And a number of papers in the 80s in general equilibrium mathematical economics tried to address this issue. So basically they came out with the fact that yes, you can essentially eliminate the possibility of coalition only, only if traders become like infinitesimally small atoms. It's Beulah, it's a bunch of people. So it actually became a field of mathematical thinking. Yes, it was. Because you have to find that. It's like, it's like, um, was it Democritus? I don't remember exactly. It's the one atom. What atom means? It can all of us. Yeah, Democritus. Uh, uh, atom, it means that you, you run an experiment. Can this, can matter be cut and cut at infinity? And he came to the conclusion that matter cannot, cannot be cut at infinity. Right? Well, it took other 2,000 and something years to come to Enrico Fermi and, 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 to, and, and to actually find the atom and actually split the atom and get the bomb out of it. Okay? But, but therefore, to come to the physical experimentation of the uh, Democritus uh, view, it, 
you need the 2,000 and more. But you got the point. Is it? There is a point. You got the point. There is a point in which matter can no longer be done. So this blue light, these words of people in the 80s in very high fluted top mathematical, uh, it's really mathematics, really pure mathematics. So now that's, at that level is just pure mathematics, is that traders have to become infinitely small and like little bubbles on a river, right? Little bubbles on the river. Millions and millions, billions of traders, infinitely small. The problem with the theory, with this thing, with this result, which gives you robustness in the theory, that makes the theory robust, it makes it empty for a very simple reason that traders lose all I mean, we are stuck with utility function, people are choosing on the reason what they like, they don't like a lot, and then they come for nothing. By the end of the day, they come for nothing in order for the theory to be consistent. Of course, this doesn't percolate through to standard textbook stuff, okay? It doesn't, uh, because uh, it would be disastrous. Uh, and so it's, it's kept, it's like, it's like top theologians that come to realize that the whole issue of God is completely out of the question, right? Uh, the whole issue of the existence of God is out. I don't believe in God, okay? I can tell you what my view is, I'm completely atheist. But what I'm saying is that some theologian that comes to the conclusion that we've got a big problem here with God, okay? That we've got a big, we don't know whether the guy exists or not, okay? And, and, and to, to put it in, in the mildest form, we don't know. When then we come to Jesus and stuff from that, I hear I actually agree with uh, uh, some uh, interpreters and an analysts of the Bible and so forth who say that Jesus may not have existed ever. Okay? Mm. There is a mathematical, there is actually a mathematician in, 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 Italy, in Italy who actually pushes, is pushing that, or differently, is pushing that liability. Okay? And, and, and so at that at that point, say some theologian says, look, you know, to the Pope, says to the Pope, look, you know, we've got a big, big, big problem here, you know, big, big problem, so what do we do? What would the Pope say? We have a big business to manage, okay? I have to manage a big business, okay? So let's not rock the boat too much, okay? Let's not tell. You know, this, let's keep it at the level of extremely uh, sophisticated theological seminar, theological school and so on. And the same thing happens here. The same thing that results about traders that you can have competitive, general competitive equilibrium for traders, only if there are such a number of them which is basically infinite and they basically disappear as entity. They disappear. That's the thing that they do not they cannot possibly express utility functions because they become completely insignificant. They're like bits, computer bits. They just disappear. They just vanish. They, they have no room for action. And that was supposed to be a theory of human behavior. But that is a killer for that approach. It's a total killer. And it has been completely, it's left only in the top mathematical journals. So this is the pure theory of general uh, barter trade equilibrium. Okay? So in the next hour, I will, after 11 minutes and 15 seconds break, uh, I will talk about production. Okay? Uh, now, the things that I've been talking about, particularly the, the law of demand, we just note it down. We'll, uh, and, 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 and the problems connected with the existence of the general equilibrium. We'll find it again uh, next week. Because I hope to finish the complete theoretical part by tomorrow and to devote the six hours which are left to uh, the discussion of policy issues. And, and we will see that the uh, 
theory that has been essentially the last dominant branch of macroeconomics in the last 20 years, it's called rational expectations. It's entirely based on the assumption that general equilibrium is actually working, that the economy out there is a general equilibrium economy. Okay? That's what, that's all the whole idea of Bernanke comes from that and, 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 and Draghi not so much, Draghi not so much, but sort of concedes to that, because Draghi has been formed in Rome, he's professor, a great professor of political economy, economic policies, Federico Caffè, one of them, he couldn't be so stupid, and therefore, I will be uh, a student of Caffè, but then he got his PhD at MIT. Uh, and uh, it's also another very good neoclassical, but very good. It was a neoclassical case in Franco Modigliani, who was an MIT got the Nobel Prize. And, uh, but then, of course, etc. things evolve. Life changes, and uh, he also, to a very large extent, subscribed to the rational expectation approach. And the rational expectation approach is based on the view that general equilibrium is actually a real thing. It's a real thing. Which something that no general equilibrium theorist has maintained. This is important. General equilibrium theorists are the ones who say, look, general equilibrium, take a good look at general equilibrium because you are not going to see it ever in the real world. Okay? So, but this is not how Chicago has uh, what Paul Fluman calls Fresh water and salt water economies. Salt water at MIT, Harvard, I mean, East Coast. Fresh water at Chicago people. And the Chicago economists, uh, they have taken general to be the real thing. And the person who has pushed that idea was one guy very well known, called Milton Friedman. He's the one who pushed that idea, and then that idea has been taken over and, and, and developed, I don't know whether developed, but has been really encapsulated into a body uh, which is called general equilibrium. This is something that happened in the 70s and 80s. But we'll find all this again, therefore, that's why I mentioned. Now, back to the origins of neoclassical economics. So, the, the theory of the approach based on methodological individualism uh, assumes no production. Okay, it's pure part of the There is no production. And indeed, Jevons and Wixie, who were really the purest, the purest of marginalist economics said that you should not have any notion of supply because even supply is determined by utility, meaning if you want by demand, therefore, by the individual demand functions. If you want something, you demand it and that's the, it's the supply. So it's the utility that determines even the supply. So they were completely against the idea of trying to merge into to merge marginalism with some kind of theory of production which is not determined by utility itself. You follow me? That they were completely against that idea. However, in Britain, you know, there is a pragmatic part of British culture, you know, it's called bread and I hate it. I hate the pragmatic part of British culture completely. Uh, but you know, bread and butter, you know, bread and butter, they call it bread and butter. And there was a bread and butter guy who was actually very smart as a matter of fact. And he's the one who, who was the founder of economics as a discipline. Economics was taught bits and pieces, was not really a discipline. I mean, Edgeworth, Edgeworth was a professor of uh, literature at Oxford. 
Yeah, and he was, he's one of the major uh, founders of uh, <coughs> contemporary neoclassical theory. So, um, economics was taught a bit in law, but there was no real program in economics. There were courses here and there, they were all called not economics, political economy. Economics is a term used by Jarrett's. Jarrett's introduced introduce the term <coughs> economics. Otherwise, they would call it political economy, as it was called by Ricardo. And all that. Uh, a guy called Alfred Marshall in Cambridge. He is the founder of the Department of, Poli of Economics at Cambridge. He is the one. And he is the one who formed the Tribos. Tribos is the Cambridge exam in economics. And he's the one, is the first ever degree in economics was at Cambridge University in the UK. Okay? There was no specific degree in economics before, at least in England as well as you know, but I think it's all in other countries as well. And it is at Cambridge University that they developed the first faculty of economics ever. First faculty of economics, not attached to law, not attached to philosophy, except it was in economics. Cambridge. That's why Cambridge is so important as economic, as an economic, uh, for the economic theory. Cambridge is completely crucial. If you think Marshall came, came from Cambridge, Pigou, who is the, uh, developed the Pareto theory of welfare economics, was Cambridge. Uh, uh, Dennis Robertson, who developed the monetary theory of uh, the business cycle, was Cambridge. Keynes was Cambridge. Okay? So, I mean, the Cambridge is completely crucial element in uh, the development in economics. So, Kim, uh, Marshall I really don't like that much this story whereby you do not have production. And so you do not want to completely junk jettison regard. He did not want to throw away total regard. Because Jevons and Wixty they throw away regard. I don't like this idea that everything depends upon uh, individual demand, that there is no conditions of supply. So, and at that time, now, nowadays, <coughs> the most ignorant bunch of people are the economists. An economist is a, almost an ignoramus by definition. I am an you know nothing. Okay? Uh, uh, except if one is a very good mathematical economist. Then because the person is good because he's a mathematician, not because he's an economist. And otherwise they are complete ignoramuses. They don't know anything. They really don't know. I mean, this is now I'm old enough to see that. They don't know. But in those years, in the 19th century, an economist was, about, was just about everything. Because we're a bit philosophers, we're a bit uh, mathematicians, when they were using mathematics, they were coming from law. So they knew many, many different things, you know? Uh, and also, they read. In fact, there was by far more interaction between different cultural traditions in the 19th century than today. Because today you just use pseudo-English. You know? It's the academic English which is used, especially by economists. They don't know how to write anyway. And they use just you know, some keywords, and that's about it. You know? And this is uh, <coughs> some kind of academic American, and that's about it. But in those days, it was Marshall read German, Marshall read French, and Marshall read Italian. So it was, and this, the French and the Italian is very important because, and in fact, he published several articles in an Italian journal which now is worth zero plus zero divided by zero, etc., which is called the Giornale degli Economisti, 
Mm? But in the 19th century, the Giornale degli Economisti was a very, very important journal, which is the, still exists. Uh, it's, if you go to JSTOR, it's there. JSTOR, which is a fantastic thing. JSTOR is a very good indication of how the European Union is a complete stupid thing. Yeah? It's a very good indication because, because the European Union is not able to do what JSTOR does. No? They cannot even set up a common database for journal articles, etc. It is the Americans. And it's not even the Americans, it's really the Carnegie Mellon Foundation. That's what the Carnegie Mellon Foundation got this huge grant to put all the major art journals uh, online from the day one of their publication. This is what JSTOR is, right? And JSTOR, you have Journal de Economisti from day one, from 1870, 1880, or something like that. In those years, it was a very, very important journal. And it remained important till the rise of fascism, essentially. Then during fascism, it became like nothing, really. It would be stagnated. And after the Second World War, uh, did not recover that much because the people that were in the chairs, the, the people who got the chairs from fascism, so they were all corporate, you know, they, they, they were mostly in following the, they were product of fascism and therefore very parochial view of, uh, of, uh, of economics. And, and Marshall wrote a number of articles as well in the, in the Giornale degli Economisti. So he, I'm saying all this because Marshall knew exactly about Valras, with whom he had correspondence, and Pareto were about. Okay, he knew exactly where they, up, where they were up to. So the question is, Marshall rejected Jevons' approach to uh, put the whole emphasis on uh, utility and no supply, but he also rejected Valras Pareto approach of uh, uh, thinking in terms of general equity. And why? Because here I must concede, I don't like bread and butter, I don't like that sort of stuff, like I don't like peanut butter, I don't like bread and butter, no, I like bread and butter, but I don't like to think in terms of bread and butter, okay? And, and however, it is precisely this English, you know, nitty gritty bread and butter, which is completely, uh, you know, for me, and I cannot stomach it, but he was right. Because it precisely this bread and butter approach that says, look, you cannot have a simultaneous general equilibrium. This is madness. Yeah. To have a system and to have it as an interpretive value, you can have it as a sort of uh, Aristotelic, big Aristotelic construction, right? But you cannot possibly, in fact, Ptolemaic, more Ptolemaic construction, uh, think of an economy as something based on simultaneous, simultaneous multi market, multi agent generation. These people are crazy. So he never bought into general equilibrium, you know? Marshall. The Marshall was immensely smart, okay, immensely smart. Thanks to his wife as well, Mary. Yeah, Mary Bailey Marshall, she wrote, she, she had co-authored a number of books with him. Uh, I don't think, I, I don't, the most important that apparently she is the person who actually wrote it is a book by Marshall with the signature of Alfred Marshall, but my former colleague who is retired and is not well, Peter Glenway at Sydney University, is a good historian, very good historian of economic, of history of economic thought, and he wrote the fundamental <coughs> book on Marshall. He, he says that, according to his research, he, uh, he says that Mary Perry Marshall, she actually wrote the book that I'm going to mention, okay? The name doesn't appear, as, as co-author, but that actually she wrote it. And that is the, um, 
called Industry and Trade, which is a very beautiful book about history of Britain, industry, and British trade. Very good book. Okay? So Marshall yeah, had, was really very, very smart person. Very smart person. And he also had, in his own approach, an evolutionary view of economics, which is not really emphasized. But I have a friend in Sydney, uh, Neil Hart, who has taken 12 years to do his PhD. And he has written now that his, his, his PhD has come out, was published by Paul Dirk Macmillan just now, just last year, two books on Marshall. And he brings that out, the evolutionary aspect. He completely revolutionized, changed the view that, uh, mm, that uh, is usually given to, to Marshall. His it's, it's, it's stuff is really great, great stuff. But what is being taken from Marshall is actually a subset. But I will concentrate on this subset because that's what made, made its way into text. So Marshall rejected general equilibrium, rejected the Jables approach of basing everything on supply, on um, utility, demand, individual demand, and did not want to reject the capital. So what he did? In just in one chapter, in, in, actually his book is divided in several books, you know, book one, book two, it's one in, in one part of his book, which is called Principles, everybody was like Principles of Politics, it's always the same title, Principles of Political Economy, uh, 1886, I think it's the first edition. What he brings out is the supply function. He's the one who brings out the supply function. Okay, so that's that way you have the supply and demand. And he has this Caesar uh, sort of Caesar uh, image that is like scissors, like two blades, okay? And the supply and demand relations are like say two blades. So what does Marshall do in that particular section of his work? He takes a he accepts utility. He accepts that commodities, goods, are individuals select according to a utility function. That is accepted. Marx accepts the utility base. Okay? What he does not like in Jevons is the fact that Jevons disregards supply production conditions altogether. Okay? So that's what he does not like. So he accepts the utility approach. So, the way in which commodities, people buy coffee or consume coffee or tea is determined exactly on the basis of the principle of marginal utility. But the supply, how, how do you then bring in the supply condition? In the supply condition, so he tries to use Ricardo. In Ricardo and Marx, the supply conditions are determined by the technique of production. Yeah, the quantity of labor time necessary to produce commodity, that quantity is determined by the technique of production. How is the technique of production in Ricardo and also Charlie and also other Swiss in that respect they do not have? Does it bother you there is too much sun? Does it bother you? Because I see that we can, we can close a bit. Yeah. That's what I do. Okay? <laughs> Nothing happens. That's the other one. Is the other one? They're both, I think. Not they're both. But <laughs> they're both. So, okay, we go to the dark. Okay. Ah, yeah, it's there. Okay. It's better. Okay. So, the, what, um, what happens is, so it, it takes, so in Ricardo, the technique of production is given, which means that the returns to scale are constant. If the technique of production is given, it means that productivity is constant. You understand? You understand? So the, 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 the relationship between output 
changes in output are perfectly symmetrical in changes in inputs. So if you want to if you want to increase output, you must increase the input by the same by the same amount. Technological change, etc., will may reduce. So if anything, output is determined by constant returns, by constant technology. You see what I mean? Uh, except in the case of agriculture, though, in Ricardo, where in agriculture you have diminishing fertility to land because you put into cultivation additional land which is less fertile. Therefore, every new plot of land that you put under cultivation will give you a lesser output than the first plot of land, right? Because it's determined by the assumption is that first you put under cultivation the most productive land, then you move to the lesser, lesser productive plots of land, and therefore you get less output out of the of the less productive plot. Marshall brings this into industrial production. Brings this principle of diminishing uh, productivity of the of the plot of land into industrial production. Okay? And in so doing he invents the supply curve. That's what happens. That's what the supply curve is because if I write like this This is the quantity, and this is the price. Okay, so you can see we are in the in the real in the domain of the law of demand. Okay, now that this is the law of demand, but now I want to look at production. So if I have a supply curve which is like this, look what happens. This is constant You see, as output increases the supply curve remains constant. So this means that the, return, the returns are the same. Right? So this is like writing, for instance, Q uh, is alpha of some input. Give me any input. Give me uh, labor input, capital input. Okay. So if I want delta Q, more output, Alpha is given is equal to delta k. Okay? So that's constant returns. You understand? Productivity remains the same and output increases exactly by increasing the same uh, the inputs in the same proportion. No? This is constant return. Now I want to, to 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 throw in the law of demand. Look what happens here. That the demand can become infinite. Right? There is no there is no limit. There is no there is no limit to this. You can go and go and go. What 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 is the limit? When when will it stop? Output will be infinite. The prices don't change. You increase output, the prices don't change. They remain the same. Same price, many different levels of output. So you keep going, you keep going. So what stops? What is the limit to output? So what Marshall does, he brings in the principle of marginal cost, diminishing marginal, increasing marginal cost, or diminishing marginal return, which is perfectly symmetrical to the diminishing marginal productivity, <coughs> marginal utilities on the consumer side. So you have. On the production side, you have diminishing marginal returns, or rather increasing marginal cost. Diminishing marginal returns are exactly the obverse of diminishing marginal cost, and uh, of increasing marginal cost, that's why I get confused. And, and this is the element which makes it possible for Marshall to come out with the uh, 
supply and demand relationship. So, first step, he assumes that firms are very small. Hmm? This notion of smallness. So they are infinitely small in relation to the market. Therefore, they cannot determine the price. This, this is an important factor in Marx. In Marx, Marx. And they don't determine the price. This means that they face a given price. Because they cannot determine that each firm faces a given price. You follow me? Okay. And then they are subject to increasing marginal cost. So that the more you produce, the more it costs you to produce. You follow me? Increasing marginal cost means that the cost of production increases as you produce more. Exactly like in land, in the Ricardian land, if you want to expand cultivation, you have to bring uh, into cultivation a, a uh, additional plot of land. This plot of land is assumed to be less productive than the previous plot of land. Okay? And therefore, it will yield lesser output than the previous plot of land. So the output is diminishing at the margin. Okay? It will increase total output, but the plot of land itself will yield less output relatively to the previous plot of land. Okay? Marshall applies it to industry, but in relation to price, to the cost of production. You follow me? To the cost of production. So, I'll just read this line. It's easier to see the look. I'll read everything. What's happening now? Why is say capital and labor and as it expands output it has to use say one factor more intensive and therefore this factor will start working operating under diminishing returns you follow me under diminishing marginal productivity conditions so productivity of the factors is not constant it will be constant only if you double up, if you increase the factors exactly in the same proportions. If, however, the firm cannot uh, uh, expand factors in the same proportion, because the framework of the analysis is that of a given 
resource endowment, the resource endowment is given, it can expand output only insofar as it uses one factor to be more labor or more capital, more intensely than the other. This will lead to a process whereby the productivity of the additional factor used, of the factor which, whose utilization has been increased, will be diminishing at the margin. It will be exactly like the land of, uh, in, in the case of Ricardo, and this gives uh, rise to an upward sloping supply curve. Okay. So that's, that's the first step of the supply curve. The second step of the supply curve is to extend this from the single firm to the so the single firm is, is called the representative firm. Okay, it's not just any single firm, it's the firm which is supposed to embody all the firms in the industry. So if you uh, manage to create this representative firm, you can say that in a particular industry, this representative firm uh, encompasses the behavior of all the firms in the industry. And if you can extend it to the economy, you can say that this particular representative firm represents all the firms in the economy. You see? So the, the extension of one into the many by remaining one. Okay? And uh, when you move to the industry, however, industry, not the economy, not the whole economy. When you move to the industry, however, the same thing now, you cannot take an infinite demand curve. You don't have an infinite demand curve for the automobile sector or even the iPhone sector. You don't have that. So you have a finite demand curve and you bring in the law of demand. That is to say, you bring in price and quantity. Okay. And the supply curve, because you use the representative firm, you already use the representative firm, and you already concluded that the firm is represented because it represents the whole, the whole set of firms in the industry, so you apply exactly the same uh, supply curve for the industry. All firms will operate on the reason of this supply curve, and here you have is a rising supply curve. Okay? And that's the supply and demand condition. So that's the supply curve, this is the demand curve. The demand curve is determined exactly by the law of demand utility considerations that we showed before. And that's going to give you the equilibrium. Supply and demand. That's the story. Okay? That is the story. And this is the story that makes it into textbooks. With the further twist that in the textbook, see, in Marshall, you move from the single firm to the industry. And in fact, Marshall never had, this is what my friend Neil Hart shows in his two volumes, never had actually this kind of diagram. These diagrams come from Pigou. Pigou is the one who followed Marshall up. He got the second, the second chair of economics at Cambridge after Marshall retired. There was only one professor then. The second chair was Pigou. Pigou is completely important. Go into Wikipedia and you see Pigou. P I G O U is absolutely important. He's the founder of welfare economics and etc. He is the one who wrote the textbook version of Marshall. He taught actually the textbook. He was a student of Marshall, obviously. And because Cambridge was totally inbred, okay, totally inbred. There was very few outsiders. Everything was Everything, they were born in Cambridge, everything in Cambridge, everything in Cambridge, everything, uh, 
was uh, inbred, like, like inbred villages up in the Alps that they intermarry and all that. The same thing was here. So, uh, and Pigou wrote the textbook version, version of, of Marshall, what made it into textbooks. And that, these diagrams are Pigou diagrams. And that's shown very well by Neil Hart in his two volume, uh, volume, volume. This is what made it into textbook. The additional twists are moved from the firm, representative firms, to the industry, which Marshall calls, he calls it, that this term is in Marshall, a representative industry. So the terms are Marshall. The representative industry is the industry that is supposed to represent every single industry in the economy. Each industry is made of a collection of firms that operate in automobile industry, Yamaha, and whatever. Yeah. And therefore, uh, this industry, if this is a representative industry, then the third step, which Marshall never made, you know, is to call, to extend this and to say, okay, if this is a representative industry for the whole economy, this is the behavior of the whole economy. Okay? If, if the, represent, the representative industry of what? Not of itself, but the representative industry of all the industries, this is the behavior of the whole economy. Now, in 1926, this is where I want to bring in Zlava. The first piece by Zlava. In Keynes was very, Keynes, in the, in the 20s, Keynes was already a big, big, big guy, you know, in Cambridge. First of all, remember that Keynes was the uh, economic advisor to Prime Minister of Britain during the Versailles, the Versailles talks, the Versailles Treaty in 1919, 1919-1920. He was the advisor to uh, Lloyd George, who was the Prime Minister of Britain at the time. So it was quite significant figure already. And in Cambridge he was early on, early in the early twenties and he stayed in that capacity till he died uh, in 1946. Um, he was the editor of the Economic Journal. And Economic Journal is the most, most and the definitely most important journal of economics in the world. Okay? The Economic Journal still exists today, the Journal of the Royal Economic Society. And, uh, and also he was writing, although he was, he, he, he was writing every now and then, he was organizing special issues, special supplements for the Manchester, now it's in London, but it used to be in Manchester, the Manchester Guardian, which still we have today. It's the Guardian because it has moved to London, the Guardian newspaper. And he came across Piero Zaffa. I think there are many reasons why he came across Piero Zappa. It's not just an intellectual. It's intellectual, it's something else, okay? It's something else. Mm. So, uh, and this something else they don't, people don't want to talk about. They don't want to talk about something else, which is, which is uh, gayness, homosexuality, etc., which was completely pervasive in Cambridge. And uh, I think that was the the mix, the policy mix, was was that. It's very important because you bring in the great uh, uh, analytic philosopher Wittgenstein. Why does he end up in, in Cambridge? You know, why do they all these strange people end up in Cambridge? You know? uh, strange in the sense that they are mental strange, not because of their of their sexuality, I don't know, because of the uniting element is actually homosexuality. And Lord Skidelsky, that's the thing, the, the good thing that he did. I don't like this book. He wrote three volumes on the life of Keynes. And he had the guts because oh, no, no, it's a pure science, pure thought, pure research. And he, had, he wrote three very important books of Keynes, basically full of gossips. Uh, on, but, but they are very important because they bring out exactly that. They bring out the uh, the uh, the Virginia Woolf dimension, and uh, because they were all connected, 
the Bloomsbury Circle, etc., in which homosexuality play, played a very, very important role as a gelling factor, as a, as a connecting factor, as an element of being together and so, uh, stuff like that. Very, very important. So, Zrafa, it's part of the policy mix. I mean, that's, that's, there's no doubt about that. You know? <laughs> and he, therefore, comes across Zrafa, who was the son of the founder of Bocconi University. It was the, he, as Rafa himself was from Turin, huh? but then his father was the founder of Bocconi University in Milan, huh? <laughs> and then he, but at that time Bocconi was not so bad, I mean, and, uh, and he came and, 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 and uh, he wrote, uh, he sent an article in 1921-22 on the banking crisis in Italy to the, to the economic journal. Keynes is very struck by the, the Zafa was absolutely lucid, absolutely lucid. And very few words, didn't write much, but everything was absolutely clear in Zafa. And he's struck by that and he asks Zafa to write an article on the policy of Mussolini uh, that was aiming at uh, uh, bringing back the old exchange rate between the lira and the gold, gold system before uh, 1914. Zafa writes this article for the Guardian. Mussolini calls, it's 1924, he calls uh, Zafa's father and says, look, I don't like your son, okay? So the next day, Zafa is on the train to to uh, to Italy, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and he never left him ever since. Although he never wanted to become British, he's always remained always remained Italian, always. But never wanted to. to. And he was even given in 1926 a chair at the university. I don't remember whether Sassari or Cagliari. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cagliari, yeah. He was given uh, was given a chair. So, and he was, hey, even during fascism, they kept paying him and he gave all the money, all the money was given in a way, to a library, to a bookshop, which purchased books for? Gramsci. For Gramsci, yeah, he was a great friend of Antonio Gramsci, one of the founders of the Italian Communist Party, not the founders, but one of the most important, that became Secretary General, and he, put that uh, Gramsci was jailed by Mussolini and, uh, in 1926 and uh, Gra uh, Zraffa, all, the, all the salary went to this bookshop in Milan that was sending books to Gramsci in jail. Uh, so Zraffa is in, in, in 1925, Zraffa wrote a very, so a very long article in Giornale degli Economisti on the relationship between the uh, price and quantities produced. And Keynes asked him to write a shorter version for the economic journal, which is called, I don't remember. It's, it's in the reading, it's, uh, because it's, I, I'm now getting demented. That's the reason why I would have remembered a year ago. Now I am completely out. Uh, this is gone. This is gone. Therefore, uh, I, because of dementia, I am uh, forgetting. No, but it's true. I mean, I'm forgetting now. I mean, I don't, I'll be out in a few years. So, uh, <coughs> he writes this article, which I have in the reading list for you, in which Zrafa demolishes then what Ninhart says is that Zafra did it, set it up against Marshall, but he should have set it up against Pigou, not against Marshall, because in Marshall this thing cannot really be found. There are some ideas about that, but not really be found. Okay, that's what I have no after Hart Neil was telling me these things. I have the book by Marshall, and in fact, that diagram cannot be found. That's completely 
with that history. So, but this is what made it into textbook. You open any first year, especially second year micro textbook, you get this stuff. Okay? In many, many different types of diagrams that you get this. So what Zarfa says, look, I mean, this is what Marshall, why? Why Marshall starts from, this is called partial equilibrium approach. So why does Marshall start from partial equilibrium? He does not believe in general equilibrium because as you cannot have multi-market simultaneous equilibrium, you cannot have it. I mean, it's crazy to think of an economy in any practical sense, that's the bread and butter story. Practical sense, getting you to a multi-market general equilibrium, it's impossible. Therefore, let's start bit by bit and let's construct a system which does give you equilibrium, but partial, not general. Let's not talk about general because we don't want simultaneity into the system. So, and let's push the argument, Marshall says, as far as we can in terms of how representative this equilibrium, this partial equilibrium is, how representative it is. The reason why the existence of a supply curve for the firm of this kind is based on the assumption, it's a crucial analytical assumption, that what the firm does does not affect the other firms. It's the firm in complete isolation. You follow me? Because if the firm were to affect the other firm, well, number one, if what the firm does were to affect the other firm, uh, this is, this is this um, uh, um, then you cannot, number one, you cannot have you cannot have a given price for the, for the firm. The, the thing that the price is given for the individual firm, it is because it is assumed that the firm is so small relative to the market, that its actions do not affect the other firms. Right? And only under those conditions you can have uh, a situation whereby the analysis of the cost and output relations are only contained within the single firm. If, however, the firm, what the firm does, affects all the other firms as well, starts affecting the other firms, then you cannot have that anymore. Okay? So you cannot derive a precise systemic relationship between output and cost. Then the second thing that Zafa, that Marshall says, okay, so we assume Marshall, his wife wrote with him, or for him, wrote the book Industry and Trade. And in Industry and Trade, they talk about what? What, what made countries like the United, the whole entire Britain to begin with, but United States, Germany, the big industrial countries in the world, what made them a big industrial power? It's increasing returns to scale, not diminishing returns, right? It's increasing returns. It's the increases in productivity which made the development, the industrial development of especially three or four countries, you know, uh, to be the dominant industrial countries in the world. And this way, you know, we can say it in, in sequence there would be Number one, perhaps, uh, I think number one was the United States after the Civil War. Now, the United States, then uh, Germany, uh, Britain to begin with, with the uh, Industrial Revolution, then, then uh, uh, that's how Adam Smith saw it as increasing, with increasing productivity. The United States, Germany, Japan, Soviet Union, and so forth. These were the countries that had became the big industrial countries of the world. So, I, it's, in, it's increasing returns, not diminishing returns. In industry and trade, 
Marshall and, and, and uh, his wife, Mary Bailey, they actually point this out. But here you have diminishing yields. So Marshall does have a view in this, in this chapter that diminishing returns operate in the short period, OK? In the short period. In the long period, OK, in the long period, it's increasing the returns. You follow me? But uh, what Zerfa points out is there's no way you can separate between diminishing return to the, to the firms and the increasing returns to the industry. There is no way. Because that's what Marsh, the argument of Marshallian economics is that there are diminishing returns to the firm, but the firm is located within the industry, and the industry is subject to, the, to increasing returns. So as the industry moves forward, the firm within the industry moves with the, in, with the industry, but in relation to itself, it keeps producing at diminishing returns. Okay? So basically, there is a parametric shift in the, in the, in the operations. So the firm shifts because it absorbs the increasing returns that belong to the industry, but it, in relation to itself, in isolation, it produces under diminishing returns. And Zappa said, look, you cannot simply, you cannot separate that. You cannot have a line that separate. You cannot find conditions of production whereby the two things can be separated. In fact, if there are increasing returns that will affect the industry, the firm directly, the, the firm itself generates the increasing returns. That's what Zafa argues. Okay, therefore, you cannot have the uh, this supply and demand story does not work. In order, supply and demand story to encapsulate competition. That is to say, this is supposed to express the conditions of competitions, not just from the utility point of view, but also by introducing production through the upward sloping supply curve. You cannot have that, he says. You cannot have that. This doesn't work. Okay? And then, therefore, he concludes with a sort of uh, deadly statement. That was in 1926, and then he doesn't write anymore till 1960. Okay, so he stays what 34 years without writing, uh, writing a lot for himself that he puts in boxes, etc., but not publishing anything uh, except the collected works of Ricardo, with a very important introduction that he wrote in the first volume of Ricardo. Uh, he wrote it with Molster. But uh, so he ends by saying, but if you really want competition, the only competition that makes sense, if you really want, said, look, I'm not saying that you should think in terms of competition, but if you really want competition, to think in terms of competition, the only way to think in competition is in the classical sense. Hmm? Because in the classical sense, you don't have this messy stuff. In the classical sense, competition simply means the formation of a uniform rate of profit under constant returns, under <coughs> without any diminishing marginal returns or increasing marginal cost. You don't have that. And the classical, classical competition is, is consistent with the production conditions. But this means, however, that demand, individual demand curves, do not affect the prices. The prices are not determined by the condition of individual demand. They are not determined by the law of demand, in other words. Okay. Prices, equilibrium prices. We are always talking about final prices. We are not talking about market uh, changes in the day to day. We are talking about prices that gravitate <coughs> toward a situation of rest. 
of equilibrium, so to speak. In the neoclassical notion of equilibrium, it's perfect market equilibrium where all commodities are purchased, are sold, etc. Markets are clear, okay? And these are the instruments through which they get to that result. This equilibrium here means that everything that is demanded is sold in that particular industry and everything that uh, everything that is demanded is purchased, sorry, and everything that is uh, 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 that is produced is sold. And output will set at, uh, at equilibrium level. That's what it means. It's market clearing position. Zafa says the only way in which you can think of competition, if you really want to think of it, uh, of the economy in those terms, is a, is in a framework in which demand, individual demand, do not determine prices, okay? And therefore, the prices are determined by cost of production, the socially necessary labor to produce commodities, in other words, in the classical sense, by cost of production and, um, and by uniform, competitive, uniform rate of profit. That's, that's the only way in which you can think, consistently of competition. But if you want to think of competition in those terms, okay, then you are bound to meet insurmountable difficulties. And leaving aside the atomistic element, the Edgeworth situation that I mentioned before, and the zone enchantment, and leaving aside all that, you are in the partial equilibrium framework chosen by, by, by Marshall, which was a more, so to speak, practical way to address the issue of market equilibria as opposed to the variation or last Pareto approach of simultaneous all general equilibrium which is unachievable, then even here we have this very big problem that you cannot, first of all, have separate, have a supply curve in isolation. You cannot have it. That is to say, you cannot have a supply curve by a lot where the action of the firm does not affect the other firm. So this you cannot have. And you cannot have a situation in which you can neglect the impact of increasing returns. You cannot. You cannot isolate this thing from increasing returns because they impact directly. They impact. You cannot have a clear cut theoretical space for this and the clear-cut theoretical space which should be more long-run space for increasing returns. So that's we'll go down down the toilet. Okay. Yeah. We flush and that's it. Okay? End of story. Ah, see you tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow we are going to talk about big cell. That is to say where the notion of diminishing marginal returns are applied to the macro economy. Okay? And Bixell is important because he invented the production function. And the production function is crucial because it is the fundamental statistical, uh, the fundamental mathematical form, form of, from which statistical forms have been derived. And if you ask OECD people, for instance, in Paris, you know OECD, IMF, you say all these people say, how do you measure growth? What do you do when you measure growth? So they go to a computer, they pull out the equations, you see very complicated equations, very complicated equations, which have to be, that they have econometric uh, versions of these equations. So they have hundreds and hundreds of equations. But you ask them, okay, show me the core equations, the real core equations. Well, that is a, a constant elasticity of substitution production function, okay? And the constant elasticity of substitution production function is just a mathematical redefinition, but theoretically exactly the same, of big cell production function, which was developed around 19... 1903, 1904, and that was an attempt to define a long-run equilibrium for the macroeconomy. Okay? Okay.